I guess I would say that I approach uh, this matter of the public intellectual uh, from a somewhat different starting point. Uh, namely, I don't take for granted that academics have ever been natural public intellectuals, that, that in a sense um, the two categories sort of uh, overlap to a certain extent, but, but um, in a sense they're also intrinsically oppositional to each other. Uh, and um, and you've, you were alluding to this actually, especially toward the end of your talk, um, and that is there's a sense in which insofar as academic knowledge production involves expertise, um, there is always going to be a, a kind of barrier placed uh, before the public. And, and I think you know, the way we express this most normally in, in, in academic life is, first of all, in the technical nature of the journal articles that we have to write, which become kind of the currency by which we are judged as you know, people who matter right, in the academy. Uh, and that immediately draws you away from, from public discourse, but also uh, within the classroom experience as well. Uh, and this is, in a, in a way, one of the more unfortunate features of academic life, which I don't think it was meant to be that way. But nevertheless, the way in which authority is exercised in a classroom is in terms of if students ask a question that, in a sense, is not informed or sufficiently informed by what they're supposed to be reading, right, they get slapped down, basically, and, and the teacher feels under no obligation, actually, to take the student's question at its face. Now, in public intellectual life, that's not allowed. And if you do that in public intellectual life, you're out of the room, OK? Uh, and so in this respect, most academics can't even get into the room uh, because there's, there's a sense in which they have a kind of learned helplessness with regard to the public, OK? And this is a term from Thorstein Veblen in the beginning of the 20th century. And he was, in fact, talking about academics in the early 20th century with regard to this. And so when I look at this book, The General Intellects, this is the frame of mind I come to it. Um, and I think, you know, if you were listening to what Mackenzie was saying at the very end when he's giving you a kind of precy of what's going on in the book, I think you begin to see what the problems are with treating these people as public intellectuals, okay? First of all, there is, and, and, and this goes in a way to the way you deal with them, actually, because it is true that you do do this kind of, you know, splice and dice and, and you know, chicken McNuggets approach to distilling all the important things that these people have to say in 4,000 words, but it's largely for purposes of consumption, I would say, within the academy, perhaps. Uh, maybe uh, a couple of journalists might pick up some concepts they could use. Um, but it seems to me, at most, what this does is facilitate a kind of um, uh, interstitial discussion among the 21 people being talked about. I think that's pretty much. Uh, and, and in a sense, this also captures kind of the spirit of what you're actually trying to promote. And this is why I wonder whether we're really talking about public intellectuals at all in any sense. Because it seems to me that part of what you want to do uh, is uh, that you want to collectivize this group of people, right? The group of people and the, and the kind of viewpoints that they represent in your book, OK? Now, uh, for those of you who, who kind of range widely in intellectual life, uh, you know, looking at those 21 people, who are, of course, quite different with regard to various things, are coming, there are enough common assumptions, enough kind of intellectual constraints that are already operating that provide a kind of natural forum for, for trading ideas and stuff, as Mackenzie illustrates very well in the book, but one that at the same time excludes a lot of the rest of the world. Okay, so for example, in this book, I would say, for virtually everyone in the book, and certainly the way you treat them, uh, Marxism is like the Bible, in a sense. And I mean the Bible in, 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 in a full kind of understanding of the Bible. Namely, it's kind of a template, right? So even though we have different kinds of readings, right, as you do of the Bible, and people emphasize different books of the Bible, right, and certain key moments and, and things like this, nevertheless, that is the matrix, in a sense, uh, in Marxism is the matrix, uh, uh, you know, in which the whole thing is unfolding. And in fact, you're actually quite good in actually showing the relevance of this kind of Marxist matrix, even to people who aren't on the surface very Marxist. Okay? Um, and, and so this is something that I think is, you, you got to kind of buy into very much at the outset. Now, one problem I have with this uh, from the standpoint of the idea of public intellectual life is that public intellectual life doesn't take Marxism for granted, right? There's a sense in which the temp, you know, whatever you want to call the template that's the starting point for public intellectual life, 
right? Even a, even a phrase as, as straightforward as forces of production, right, seems a bit alien to the public, even though that's one of the simpler terms in the Marxist discourse, which is, of course, part of the common currency. So there's a sense in which even if you were to succeed on your own terms, with regard to collectivizing these people and, and getting them to be kind of on the same page and moving direct, you know, moving together in some sort of fashion, um, you, you haven't really accomplished quite that much with regard to the issue that you need to be addressing, at least by your own standards, right? Because you're worried about the Anthropocene, right? You're worried about the end of the world, right? And, and a lot of your people, are, you know, go on and on about the end of the world, actually. Timothy Morton probably being the most ecstatic one. Um, but the, and, and, and yet, you know, you, you, what you're aiming for at this point is still so far away from what would engage with the, you know, with the power that could actually change any of the things that, to a large extent, you rightly see as wrong with the world, right? So there's a sense in which we're, re, you know, you, you know the, 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 the ambition, to be honest with you, is not as... It, 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 there's a lot of words, it's very sophisticated, it's very intellectually interesting, but, but the ambition in terms of what you claim to be the ultimate task, which is to change the world, which is of course the public intellectual task, right, Jean-Paul Sartre, all that kind of stuff, all on board with that, um, you're really far away to getting to the starting gate, okay? Um, and, and, and so I want to say some, you know, See, in this regard, it's interesting what the problem is, I think, with, with what you're doing. Because one of your heroes, that you, didn't, you, you, you almost mentioned his name, I don't think you quite did, but when you were talking about the social relations of science movement, right, John Desmond Bernal, okay, uh, have any of you heard of him? He was the great Marxist uh, X-ray crystallographer, trained the people who, uh, in fact, uh, discovered the, the double helix structure of DNA, but he didn't get a Nobel Prize himself because he was too busy campaigning and doing other things, but very smart man. Okay, uh, he had his lab at Birkbeck College here, uh, and he was great Marxist. He brought all of the great Marxist historians in 1937 to a big conference in London, um, and, and he was really kind of a firebrand and a real public intellectual on the Marxist side of the issue. Okay, um, and one of the things, one of his ambitions, and you, you talk about this a bit in your book, was that in a sense, uh, once it looked like the, you know, once it looked like the proletariat revolution, uh, as originally conceptualized by Marx, wasn't quite going the way it was supposed to go, that there would be a sense in which one would organize scientific workers of the world. And the scientific workers would be a kind of, you know, informed proletariat that actually could take over the means of production, because in the early 20th century, they were already being insinuated into all parts of the means of production, whether we're talking about business or the military or anything like that. And the scientists were the brains behind all this, and, and, and you know, and, 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 you know, if you were actually to get them, as it were, to get into some kind of international union, right, they could have an enormous amount of power. Right? Now that's what Bernal was going after, okay? Uh, and that's what always made him throughout his career a somewhat dangerous guy, okay? Um, but he actually had a lot of influence. The influence, of course, turned out to be quite diffuse because, of course, this great union never took place. Uh, but one person I would just mention in passing, because he only died a couple of years ago and he's relevant to sort of environmental concerns, is Barry Commoner. Uh, in the United States, right? Barry Commoner, one of the leading ecologists in the United States, uh, who actually ran for president at one point, um, and, and he was inspired, actually, to get into this kind of politically, you know, think about ecology from a politically active perspective, which led him to complain about things like nuclear radiation, right, and, and air pollution and water pollution and all this kind of stuff from a scientific standpoint, okay, was listening to Bernal at Harvard when he was doing a, a, a tour, because Bernal in the early 1930s thought that with the Great Depression, right, that, that this may be the moment where there's a collapse of capitalism, right, because people would begin, and so Bernal was going to kind of move and start organizing the troops, as it were. Uh, he didn't get very far, but he inspired a lot of people in the process. Well, what ended up sinking this project of Bernal's uh, was the fact that um, it really became, it, it was impossible for scientists to develop class consciousness right, in the appropriate Marxist sense. In other words, they were primarily affiliated with whomever was paying their paycheck. And, right, and so it wasn't possible, actually, to speak across those kinds of very significant institutional, economic, political barriers, okay? Now, if you compare the task that Bernal was putting for himself, which is a very, very enormous task, right, and, and in a way, we're not too surprised it failed, okay? Um, 
And you compare it to what your task is, your task is relatively minuscule because you're trying to overcome jargon, basically. You're trying to overcome intellectual differences, most of which, and I think you admit this, are manufactured within the academy itself. Right? Uh, so, you know, uh, so you, you were talking about sovereignty, issues of sovereignty, right? The uh, intellectual sovereignty. And it is, it is always very striking that, you know, whenever academics um, start saying, oh, intellectual property is bad, you know, and, and we got to overturn this in the vectoral class and all this kind of stuff, um, you think about how academics operate, right? That in a sense, what academics do, right, in order to maintain their own basis of power within the academy is, in fact, to engage in forms of intellectual property, which is conveyed through certain kinds of technical discourses, certain kinds of credentialing, where you have to, you know, you know, spend hundred thousand dollars on an education. I think you mentioned that in passing, right? In order to get to the point where anyone takes you seriously, right? It's a high entry cost, as the economists would say. Again, an obstacle to any kind of public intellectual engagement. Okay. Um, now, so, so there's a sense in which if you compare Bernal's aspiration in terms of the kinds of barriers he was trying to break down to create this kind of, you know, uh, universal class of scientific workers versus, you know, trying to break down the barriers you're trying to break down in order to create this class of general intellects, right, you know, you're small potatoes by comparison to Bernal, and yet it's a struggle, as you yourself point out so well, okay? So that's the interesting point, right? It's a struggle. It's not like I'm saying that it's easy to do what he's doing, but the point is even if he did it, we're really nowhere near where we need to be with regard to public intellectual life and the possible transformation of the world because there's still this business of how do you connect to power in the, in the, re, in the sense that matters, right? The forces of production in your term, in a, in a real meaningful sense. Now here I want to say a little bit about uh, journalism. Okay, uh, because uh, I, you, you have some disparaging things to say about journalism, and it's very much uh, common, uh, actually, to get this kind of thing, especially from the academic side of intellectual life. Uh, but I want to say something positive about journalism, and it has a lot to do um, with the, the, the way the world has been ever since we started producing a surplus of academic people in the universities. Uh, namely, there are no jobs for them in the university. Right? You may have run, that, run across that phenomenon. There are no jobs for all these people who've paid $100,000, you know, just to be able to sit at the feet of some, you know, intellectual guru. Um, and, and so what happens is they often go into journalism, they go into the media more generally, you know, in all the different parts of the media, so producing shows as well, not just writing. Um, and um, this is actually, I think, has had an elevating effect in public discourse, okay? So in other words, the spillover effect from the surfeit of academically trained people in our society, right, uh, actually has been, in a way, doing some of the relevant public intellectual work. And in a sense, we, we need to respect that and, and, and kind of um, be more favorably inclined to it. Because I can tell you, you know, just based on the way my own, because you, as you know, those of you who know something about academic politics these days, know that there's a great push for engagement, right? Research has to be engaged, because there's a, there's a general you know, understanding that uh, academic research doesn't connect enough with the public, not even with policymakers, you know, not even in an instrumental way, let alone in any more kind of edifying or critical way. Um, and so there's a pressure actually being put on us to do this. Academics find this incredibly difficult. And of course, the, it's the media side that's the problem, right? It's those journalists. They misrepresent everything I say. They, they misinterpret me. You know, uh, and, and I only do it once and never again will I do it. This is a very typical kind of story you get from, from these people, um, from academics, that is, with regard to journalists. I think this is, this is a very bad way to look at it, and I think, but the reason why I think academics tend to regard journalism this way is because I think academics, again, operating on the assumption that in some sense they ought to be driving the public intellectual process, even if they're not very good at it. That in some sense it's their ideas, it's their, you know, and that in some sense the journalists ought to be kind of the midwives, you know, and they ought to be the ones who are somehow uh, enabling uh, all of these, uh, you know, brilliant ideas that too bad I can't actually say them in straight English, getting to the public, right? But if, of course, when we're talking about journalists in the way they are, they are now in terms of their training, um, they have an independence of mind, okay? Uh, and, they're, and they're not stupid, and they are knowledgeable. And, and, there is, and there is a sense in which these are the people who, in a sense, probably do the most to construct whatever public sphere there is and whatever public discourse there is, okay? And insofar 
as those of us in the academy who consider ourselves intellectuals or inspiring intellectuals find ourselves in, in, in opposition to these people in some kind of fundamental way, I think we're sort of missing the point of what our target is. Okay? Because part of, you know, if you want to talk about public intellectual life, you have to be able to connect with the public. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, that, that, of course, you want to raise the public or do, change the public's mind. Of course you want to do all that. And that's what intellectuals have done in the past. But the point is you have to connect with the public. That's a very fundamental, basic kind of thing. Um, and so I am, not, I, mean, I mean, I do think that some of the people that you talk about, um, you know, so let's take somebody like Slavo Žižek, okay? Slavo Žižek is probably the guy of all the people you talk about who I think, you know, uh, comes closest to being a public intellectual in a sense that looks a little bit like Sartre. Little bit, little bit, kind of, I don't know, you know. Hi history, Hi yeah, I was going to say history <laughs> happens twice, exactly. Yeah, he had a kind of a Louis Napoleon kind of way. Yeah, um, yeah, and 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 but the, there are interesting, but there are some things about this guy, about Zizek. Even though he is a guy who sells enormous amounts of books, and everybody, you know, all students love to flock to, to his lectures. First of all, it is very telling. This guy hates teaching, right? He hates teaching. He is very restrictive with regard to kinds of questions he gets whenever he does one of his stand-up routines. Right? This is not a guy who engages. He may be a guy who persuades, okay? And here I would say that the reason why Zizek is able to persuade is because this guy is mooching off of capital that's been, intellectual capital has been developed from the last two generations once Marx and Freud started to be seen as somehow common travelers. Right? So starting in the late 1960s with the Frankfurt School and all the rest of that, and of course Lacan and, and, and the French side of this, and, and now we've had two generations of, uh, of academically trained people, you know, repeating this stuff and extending this stuff and, and even vulgarizing this stuff, that was only a matter of time before somebody like Zizek would be able, you know, to steal the stage. Right? Because people already know this stuff implicitly. He's not telling them anything they don't know. This is why this is a man who preaches to the converted. Right? And he has no... He, yeah, yeah, and, he, and this is why he has, as far as being a general public intellectual is concerned, he has no effect because he is preaching to the converted. He doesn't make anyone feel guilty, right? Except they, no, he makes them feel they have guilty pleasures, right? He doesn't, he, he's not the conscience of the society, right? He is just reproducing what you already think, okay? And the fact that this is the closest that academics can get to a public intellectual says something about how far away we are from where we ought to be. Okay? Um, I, I mean, I've been going on for a while. I hadn't realized I was going to have so much to say about this. But um, I'll take that as a good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but it, it seems to me that, that, that if we are going to be serious about being public intellectuals, I must say, while I do find your book very useful as a kind of guide to some people who at the moment are seen as quite interesting thinkers for our time, I think these people that you're talking about aren't really, as the book advertises, because I'm looking at the back of the book now, and the book is, is, is said, a guide to the thinkers and ideas that will shape the future. No, this is not how I see these people. Um, I see them more as sort of ecstatic representations of the present. Right? So in other words, these are the, the symptoms of frustration of intellectual life. Right? So these are people who can come up with very clever ideas, uh, you know, to capture where we are now. You know? Um, you know, and, and, and this is what these guys... So, so from the standpoint of historians of the future, these people will be very interesting. Right? They will probably be most interesting to a historian of the future trying to figure out what was going through those, the minds of those people in the early 21st century. These guys actually capture it very well, because they're really turned, you know, they're sort of turned on in a way, right? But is this a guide to the future? No, because they actually have no way of projecting forward, right? Because they have no sense of getting beyond the frameworks in, which enable them to see as well as they can about the current situation. And, and, and they, you know, and I, by the way, because uh, you wrote a couple of years ago, and uh, when, when the Cyborg Manifesto had its 30th anniversary, um, you, you uh, you wrote a, a piece saying we need another cyborg manifesto. And my view, I mean, again, people, you've got to look at that document from the 1980s, and it's a document from the 1980s. That's where it belongs. 
right? And what we don't need is, as it were, another snapshot of the time we're in, as it were, you know, a kind of 2015 version, the snapshot of 2015. Well, that's, while that's great for historians who do an autopsy on our times, it is not at all clear that this is the kind of thinking and writing that will actually get us to a kind of future that we want to be living in. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Steve. Yeah.